Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. Socialists aim for a world which doesn't need borders and ends national divisions. But today, many national groupings are forced into larger states which repress their right to decide their own destiny. How do Marxists address the complexities of the so-called national question, maximising international workers' cooperation while supporting the right to national self-determination? This led to multiple controversies during the lifetime of Leon Trotsky. In our latest instalment on his ideas, we ask how they apply today. This episode of Socialism looks at socialism and national liberation, Trotsky and the national question. One of the most important questions for revolutionaries is the question of national liberation. We've talked in earlier episodes in this series on Trotsky and Trotskyism about the need to complete the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution, which include establishing unified nation states and freeing nationalities from oppression by imperial masters. That is something which continues, of course, under capitalism and is an extremely complicated question, or can be. And it's something which Lenin and Trotsky in particular put a great deal of thought into as an essential component of the Russian Revolution firstly, but also of the World Revolution, and it's an issue which continues to have great importance to this day, as we'll discuss. We've got with us today Niall Mulholland from the Committee for Workers International. Hello, Niall. Hello. Our first question is that Marxists often quote Lenin on the national question, as we call it, the struggle for national liberation and his support of the right of nations to self-determination that was crucial to the success of the Bolshevik Revolution in October 1917. Did Trotsky agree with Lenin on this approach, and did he add anything to the Marxist understanding on the national question? Well, he did agree with Lenin's approach. He came into full agreement with Lenin during 1917. Prior to the First World War, there were some minor differences between Lenin and Trotsky in the national question, The national question was a fierce debate amongst the Second International, but they did agree on the right to self-determination for nations. And whenever we Marxists say the national question, what we actually mean is the oppression of nations and national minorities. And it was a challenging issue for Marxists in their time. It's even more complex, we would argue, and challenging today, particularly as capitalism enters a new crisis economically and socially national tensions and national oppression will worsen and therefore it's very important for us to look at the ideas and lessons of Lenin, Trotsky, Marx, Engels and the Bolshevik Revolution in order to try and formulate policies and a programme for the workers' movement today in this very difficult at times subject. But Trotsky of course was well acquainted with the national question. He grew up in Tsarist Russia which as Lenin said was the prison house of nationalities He lived for a number of years in Vienna, which is in the heart of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which comprised ten different nations. And he, of course, came from a Jewish background, and that meant, of course, he had special interest in the situation facing the Jews of Europe and Russia and internationally. So he always had a very close eye on these developments. Like I say, prior to 1914, Lenin and Trotsky had complete agreement on the right of nations to self-determination, On this, they had disagreements with Rosa Luxemburg, who, of course, was a towering figure in history as far as Marxists are concerned. But she was... she was the German revolutionary leader. She was the German-Polish revolutionary leader. He was killed in the attempted German revolution. But she, prior to the First World War, she had a one-sided position on the national question, particularly concerning Poland. And this is understandable because inside the workers' movement, The advocates of Polish independence tended to be from the right of the movement and the Polish nationalist movement was led by quite reactionary forces. So she saw it as something that was a diversion from the workers' struggle. But Lenin and Trotsky both understood that unless the Polish workers had the right to self-determination, to have their own independence, not just from Tsarist Russia but from other powers, unless that was carried out, the socialist struggle could not be fulfilled in that part of the world. And therefore they did support that struggle at that time. So Trotsky was in broad agreement with Lenin. And during the Russian Revolution, afterwards, when Trotsky described it in the history of the Russian Revolution, his book in the 1930s, 
He described Lenin's approach on the national question as a treasure for humankind because he had put forward a position that meant that the socialist revolution, as you mentioned at the beginning, could be fulfilled in Russia in 1917. And of course, you know, as you said, the position for Marx and Engels onwards is that Marxists are internationalists. We don't want to see borders and uh, divisions between the working class. But at the same time, we understand the rights of self-determination, the rights of the nationally oppressed. And Marx and Engels were great advocates of the right of Poland to independence. They supported Irish independence as well mm -hmm. during that period. And in doing so, and of course, they didn't give any support to reactionary nationalist ideas of the bourgeoisie, of the ruling class. Mm. They stood for the working class leading those struggles. And they said, of course, that, you know, in the case of Ireland, that Britain would be enchained. It would have chains around it as long as Ireland was unfree. And what they meant by that, of course, is that the struggle for national independence in Ireland had to be part of the struggle for socialism on these islands at that stage for them to be successful because then that would end the national division which the ruling class played on, the British ruling class at that time. So Trotsky would have of course imbued himself with those ideas and the lessons of Marx and Engels whilst at the same time he agreed with Lenin his position in 1917 allowing all the many nationalities that were pressed by Tsarism to determine their own future and that did happen and the Bolsheviks when they took power allowed nations to decide their own future. In the case of Finland, it was agreed by the Bolsheviks that Finland could go separate and become an independent state mm -hmm. in 1918. Of course, that led on to great tragedy because we then had the civil war in Finland where the white reactionaries put down the revolution in bloodshed. But nevertheless, it was correct for them to give that right to self-determination. As far as the other countries were concerned of the former Tsarist Empire, they decided to stay within the Socialist Federation that Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks established. And that meant, of course, that these were nations that had the right to be part of a Socialist Federation with Russia, but on a completely equal and free and voluntary basis. That was the idea, at least, put forward by the Bolsheviks at that time. And we can counterpose that to what happened in Austria, can't we? So, for example, when Trotsky lived in Vienna, which was, as you point out at that time, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, he argued against the Austrian Social Democrats' theory of what was called national cultural autonomy. What was that debate about, and does it have lessons for us today? Yes, Trotsky lived there for a number of years, and he actually used the example of the Austrian Social Democracy's position on nationalism to contrast it with Lenin's correct position on the national question. He spends almost a whole chapter in this in the history of the Russian Revolution, and the Austrian Social Democrats had put forward really what was a muddled and dangerous theory of national cultural autonomy. And what that really was, was an opportunist attempt to reduce the national question to a question of cultural and linguistic issues. And in effect, it was a way of avoiding the national question. It was a way of the Social Democrats in Austria avoiding or trying to deflect from the policy of the ruling class of the Austro-Hungarian Empire an Austrian-Hungarian empire is made up of ten nations, but it was certainly not free or equal or mm. voluntary. And instead of opposing that, the Austrian Social Democrats tried to theorise why that was acceptable. They even went as far as accepting the annexations that that empire carried out right up until and including the First World War. And what it meant, of course, was that within the workers' movement, the Austrian Social Democrats argued that workers should be organised separately on the basis of nationality, of culture and other aspects of identity like language. They also argued for completely separate schooling systems on the basis of nationality. So that of course would have just, well it became a policy that fanned the flames of chauvinism and division within society and the workers movement and it was actually to have you know big consequences because after the collapse of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire at the end of the First World War, a revolutionary situation opened up in that part of Europe. But the Social Democrats, who had tied themselves to the dual monarchy of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, did not have the authority amongst workers to lead a struggle to come to power. Neither did they have the desire for it either. They didn't want to come to power on the same basis of the Bolsheviks with a revolutionary programme. So it led to great divisions in society at that stage. And we would say, actually, it sort of echoes today's identity politics it echoes the idea of you know, those on the left who advocate separation amongst the working class based on language, culture and other forms of identity. Now, of course, we stand for the rights of all minorities, of those who are oppressed and discriminated against 
and that they should have full and equal rights, but in multicultural societies to put forward the ideas of the Austrian Social Democrats in today's circumstances would just mean division on the basis of nationality, language, ethnicity, and of course that would be disaster for the workers' movement. So Trotsky took aim at those ideas and argued against them at that stage and pointed out that you know great sensitivity is always needed towards minorities in multicultural societies, but the main aim of Marxists should be the unity of the working class on the common struggle against common misery, and by overcoming and overthrowing capitalism, then you can have a society where all rights are guaranteed. So the Austrian Social Democrats, in effect, were entrenching national divisions and cultural divisions within the Austro-Hungarian Empire without giving those increasingly divided nationalities without standing for them to have the right to even manage their own affairs. So from both angles, they were compounding the problem. Whereas the Bolshevik approach of Lenin and Trotsky was, on the one hand, to stand for internationalism, but at the same time, to stand for the right to the complete autonomy of any national grouping, such that they were not compelled to be part of any particular grouping, but could enter on a voluntary basis into that. And on that basis, they were able to actually convince national groupings to come towards them and combine with them on a completely different basis without having to constantly look over their shoulders. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and this also applied in Tsarist Russia as well, the general principle of Bolsheviks and Trotsky. In the Russian workers' movement, there's a big debate with the Jewish Bund, which was the you know workers who came from a Jewish background who were involved in the Russian social democratic movement at that time. And the Jewish Bund argued that within the workers' movement in Russia there should be separate organisations based on nationality. Mm. And Lenin and Trotsky opposed this. They stood for the rights, of course, of the super-oppressed Jewish workers inside Russia. But they pointed out that you know demands of the Jewish Bund for their own separate ethnic-based organisations within the Russian Social Democrat and Labour Party, as it was called then, implied that that organisation would be no more than a loose federation of national and ethnic-based parties rather than a party united in fighting for workers' struggle, workers' unity, and for socialist revolution. And within that, of course, inscribed in the banner of the Bolsheviks was the right to self-determination for oppressed nations and full rights for all minorities. And after the Russian Revolution, which was successful because of that programme, after the revolution, Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks did put forward the idea, for example, that even the anarchists could experiment with their own homeland, their own state, at a certain point, and that wasn't possible because of the situation of the civil war that was raging across Russia at that time. As far as the Jewish population was concerned, Lenin and Trotsky didn't consider them a separate nation as such at that time. Mm. They considered them a specially oppressed caste at that stage. But, you know, things move on and the national question is never fixed. Consciousness is never fixed. And in the 1930s, Trotsky adapted his position particularly because of the desperate situation facing the Jewish population in Europe who were facing extermination under the Nazis and extreme oppression in one country after another. And the idea of a separate Jewish homeland became popular, obviously, amongst bigger sections of the Jewish population. Trotsky also opposed the idea of an Israeli state, of a Jewish state inside the Middle East, because he said that would be a recipe for disaster. It would be no land of milk and honey. It would mean endless wars with our neighbours. Yeah, and, a bloody trap, he called it. And he? a bloody trap, exactly. And that's been borne out by history. That has happened. But Trotsky did put forward the idea in the 1930s that if there was, you know, a growing mood amongst big sections of the Jewish population of their own homeland, that is something that could conceivably be discussed in taking place in Latin America, for example, or Africa, with the agreement, of course, of the peoples in those continents. That's on the basis of an extreme oppression and the threat of Nazism at that point in history. Now, of course, things have moved on again. We, the CWA, and Trotskyists at the time, at the end of the Second World War, did not support the creation of Israel for the reasons we just said. Mm. But once that nation was created, or that state was created, over a period of 70 years, and national consciousness does develop, and there is now, obviously, such a thing as an Israeli consciousness, as an Israeli state, and so on. But, of course, we say that the Palestinians should also have their rights, they have been uprooted and they've been made homeless and they also deserve the right to have their own homeland in the Middle East. So that's why we put forward the idea of two states, one for the Israeli population and one for the Palestinians. But neither will exist in a stable form 
or in the sense of the Palestinians in any recognisable form as a nation under capitalism. And that's why we put forward the call for... Well, because today, if you look at the map of Israel and the Palestinian Authority and those areas all around it, it's quite clear that the settlements and the encroachments by the Israeli state into Palestinian areas mean that it's impossible actually to have a joint up territory that could be called Palestine and be a viable state. Mm. And that's obviously conscious policy by Netanyahu and other reactionary bourgeois at the top of Israeli society. And of course they don't want a separate Palestinian state because they would fear it would be radicalised because of the oppression of decades, because of the desperate poverty, that it would be you know an unstable entity right on their border and would be against the interests of the Israeli ruling class. And they're backed in that by the likes of Trump and others, of course, because it's also in the interest of American imperialism, and most Western imperialist countries, actually, not to have a separate Palestinian state. And for that matter, actually, most of the Arab reaction regimes, in reality, don't support a Palestinian state Mm. of, of a viable character because of the threat it might pose to their own rest of populations. So under capitalism, it's not going to happen although they might try and move at some point in some direction of some sort of canton state, but not a state as we understand it, where the Palestinian people can prosper and have a decent standard of living and have real security. But neither will the Israeli working class have that either, as long as the, in inverted commas, Palestinian problem exists. And therefore, as socialists, we have to tell those truths, you know, and say that's the reality. But we do support the right of the Palestinians to their own state. We also say that the Israeli population also have the right to have a state, but not at the cost or expense of oppressing others. And therefore, the only way around that is to fight for two independent socialist states, which again, we would argue, would need to be part of a socialist federation of the region on an equal and voluntary basis, because otherwise you can't overcome the deep national and ethnic and religious problems that exist, not just amongst Palestinians and Israelis, but throughout the whole of the Middle East. And a socialist federation like that can pool together the big resources that exist in the region and mean a big transformation in living standards and conditions and over time the national differences and divisions would begin to wither away. And presumably this would come with special recognition and rights for, for example, Arab and Christian people living in a Jewish state and for Jewish people living in an Arab state and their culture and language and rights would need to be also recognised and served in those other states. There's also, I suppose, the question of if an independent Palestine did emerge, what kind of strength would it have on a capitalist basis to, as it were, stand on its own two feet? Would it not then come under the control of larger capitalist powers around the world, even potentially of Israeli capitalism, and therefore still in reality be a kind of vassal state to superior capitalist powers? I think so. I mean, it would just be a bigger version of the Palestinian Authority, which exists at the present time, which formally speaking, is an independent entity, which of course is also formally hugely reliant on Israel, which treats it as a massive prison house, in effect, Mm. of a people. And a so-called independent Palestinian state on the basis of capitalism is going to be economically very weak. It's going to struggle even with the basics of electric and sewage and other infrastructural issues because of the massive investment which would be needed, which is not going to happen on the basis of capitalism. And also, of course, it would be the plaything of the big powers internationally mm. and the local powers who would use it to further their own interests. And because of those conditions, the Palestinian working class within it would not recognise that as genuine independence and genuine self-determination. They would clash with the equivalent of the PA and the you know heads of state today. And that would mean, of course, it would be very unstable. It would have very rest of population. And therefore, it could be no solution for the working class of Palestine or for Israel or the whole region. So at the same time as the socialist revolution requires standing for national liberation, national liberation actually requires socialist revolution. Yes, I mean, it's possible, of course, that you can have self-determination and independence for countries under capitalism, and we have seen it. Mm. It's possible that can happen somewhere like Scotland. Mm. Although the ruling class in Britain will do almost everything to stop that taking place. But ultimately, of course, that can happen. But in some countries where it's a very complex situation, where you have two different parts of the population looking in different directions, it's so complex that on the basis of capitalism, there is no long-term solution. So, for example, look at Northern Ireland, Mm. where we've had over 20 years of the so-called peace process, where there has been an assembly established, a power-sharing assembly, between unionists and republicans and nationalists and so on for a number of years. But that body keeps breaking down. Mm. 
and it breaks down largely because of on the ground the sectarian differences have grown, not lessened. And what lies behind that is the fact that the country is still partitioned. That's come more to the fore since Brexit and the whole idea of a border pull. And it's brought home to people that the national question has not been resolved in Ireland. And we have always argued that the peace process and the institutions that have been established on the basis of the Good Friday Agreement were no panacea. There were no long-term solution. I mean, workers obviously welcomed peace after three decades of conflict. And it was mass workers' protests actually largely that led to the peace process and the war exhaustion on both sides in the conflict and all sides in the conflict. But it was never a long-term solution. And we can see that today with how fragile it is, particularly, as I said, since the Brexit result and the whole demands by Sinn Féin and others for a border poll. So, you know, in a country like that, we've got the same territory shared by one part of the population looks towards union with Britain, the other part of the population wants United Ireland. On the basis of capitalism, that's only a recipe for conflict mm. in the longer and shorter term, very often. And that's why we put forward the idea of a socialist Ireland. And that would need, of course, you know, historically high level of unity of the Catholic and Protestant working class and a mass workers' party to reach that situation. And then in a socialist Ireland, of course, the rights of the Protestant minority would be fully guaranteed and there'd be no hint of coercion whatsoever. And that was always the position of Lenin and Trotsky in Russia, you know, after the Russian Revolution. Why is it that on the basis of socialism, this phenomenon of, for example, different sections of the population looking in different directions when there is a national question, how is it that socialism would overcome that? Socialism would overcome it because socialism offers a society where the living standards can be massively raised and in that sense society can be changed and also people would have direct control of their affairs and their future. So workers would run society and run industry on a democratic plan basis and those two things combined would lead to a a situation where all the old tensions and all the old crap, as Marx put it, of capitalism would begin to recede over a period of time. I mean, some people were quite optimistic and thought that capitalism itself, or even Stalinism, had overcome the national question, Mm. especially during periods of economic growth. So, for example, it's been a bit of a shock to some on the left that the national question was re-arose in Scotland, because Scotland was seen as an integral part of the British Empire that had Mm. gained from the empire. Why on earth would the national question come back in that case? And, you know, we always pointed towards the likely development of the rise of nationalism in Scotland because of the deteriorating economic situation. And unless the workers' movement can offer a way out, if it doesn't do so, then, of course, the ideas of nationalism can grow. And sometimes those ideas can be in a progressive direction and can be leftish. And sometimes it's bourgeois nationalism, as we see in the case of the SNP, the Scottish National Party in Scotland. And that's why it's so important for Marxists always to take an independent class position on the national question, not to find ourselves coming behind one section of the bourgeoisie against another on these issues. We have to put forward a position that corresponds with the democratic aims and aspirations of the working class, which includes the national question, which after all is a bourgeois democratic demand, not a socialist demand as such. And we have to support those democratic demands where there's a genuine mood for it. At the same time, we always have to have the overarching aim for a socialist society and to struggle for that. So I suppose to illuminate that a little bit, it's worth noting that those periods in history where there are particularly pronounced economic and social crises, those tend to be the periods in history when national questions rise back up the agenda and oppressed nationalities are more likely, particularly the working class and poor in those oppressed nationalities, are more likely to come out in favour of some form of autonomy or independence because they are looking for a way out of their dire social conditions. And socialists would say, yes, fine, you have the right to do that, but let's take it in a socialist direction. However, those at the top of those oppressed nationalities, those who stand to make a profit out of it, are looking for something quite different. They're looking for a more effective way to exploit and wring profit out of their own working class and, of course workers and poor around the world. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I would say that there's been fairly good recent examples of that. I mentioned Scotland. I mean, the national question re arose in Scotland because of deindustrialisation over decades, because of the poll tax was introduced in Scotland first by the Thatcher government, which was seen as very punitive by the Scottish people, and because they felt that, you know, as their economic situation worsened, as unemployment 
became greater in the 1980s and the 1990s. The idea of British imperialism or British capitalism bringing the country together and leading to an increase in living standards, it just had no support anymore amongst big parts of society. Mm. And therefore nationalism, the idea of a separate country that could run its own affairs and have the wealth from the oil as it was at that stage, that got popular support. We also saw a similar process in Catalonia over the last number of years Mm. where that issue of Catalonian nationalism seemed to have gone back and receded quite a lot over the last number of decades. But actually, under Franco rule for a number of decades, the Catalan people were very oppressed, their language was oppressed. It is one of the richer parts of Spain, but a lot of historical grievances are still there. There is also, after the 2007-2008 economic and financial crisis, there was a huge austerity attacks in Catalonia, and people really felt their living standards being under attack. And with all that explosive mix, nationalism was bound to grow. Mm. And of course, you had a section of the bourgeoisie, the ruling class in Catalonia, who quite cleverly exploited that. I mean, but they were half-hearted. They sort of burnt their fingers because they put demands on the central government in Spain, demanding the right to have a referendum to decide their future. The very centralised Spanish government, who still got lots of traits of Francoism, Mm. they just refused point-blank to allow that referendum the government, dominated by the nationalists at that time in Catalonia, held their own referendum just a few years ago. Fair enough. And it was formally an illegal referendum. When people went to the vote, you may remember it in the TV pictures, you know, the police were sent in in a very brutal manner. Yeah, the federal them. police, the Guardia Civil, but the local right. police were actually alongside the firefighters and the workers. That's right. Part of defending that referendum. Yeah. At that time. <laughs> at that time. And they came in hard against that and really caused an explosion of anger, and there was huge demonstrations of millions taking place in Catalonia. But we said at the time that the nationalist bourgeoisie in Catalonia were not prepared to fight this all the way through. They were always using this as a bargaining stick. They were prepared to go for something less than full independence, as long as they could get more rights for Catalonia, which included, of course, first and foremost, their rights to Mm. exploit the working class more and to get a bigger part of the cake of the economy. And, you know, they fled abroad, half of them whenever they're under threat of arrest and they sort of beheaded the movement at that stage but that just shows how these movements can flare up over a period of time and Trotsky is always very aware of this in the early 1930s just at the eve of the Spanish Revolution he put forward the idea of the right of self-determination for Catalonia mm-hmm. he didn't advocate separation at that time he said it would still be better for Catalonia to be part of a socialist Spain but with enhanced autonomy for that part of Spain and once the revolutionary movement really took off he said that it was the duty of the revolutionaries right across Spain to support that right of Catalonia and the Basque area for self-determination. And he said if they didn't do that, it could undermine the revolution because it could allow nationalists to exploit that and to be used against the revolutionary forces at that stage. Mm. Now, Trotsky's own considerations on all of these different national questions, as you said, show that national questions are not fixed, but they're contingent on various changeable factors in the real world. We've given the example of what in Trotsky's day was called the Jewish question, the calls for a Jewish homeland, where he changed position on that as a result of real changes in world circumstances and how Trotskyism afterwards has reached a new position again. And the position which the Committee for a Workers' International puts forward, for example, is controversial on the left. There are other forces who might call themselves Trotskyists who, I suppose in our view, are not consistently applying that method, who cling to outdated historical formulas or do not apply the class approach of saying that the workers and the poor need to lead the way out of national oppression rather than liberal bourgeois forces, liberal capitalists. But nonetheless, while we stand for a two-state socialist solution in Israel-Palestine, what if There was a new intifada in Palestine, a revolution carried out by the workers in Israel, and they decided on that basis that they wanted a combined state. Would we stand against that? We don't have a blueprint on the national question. I think that's one of the lessons. If you look at Marx and Engels, Lenin and Trotsky, they all had evolving positions on some of the big issues of the day Mm. as far as the national question is concerned. In the 1840s, Marx and Engels supported autonomy for Ireland, not full right independence, because they thought at that stage in the 1840s and 50s that the revolutionary process in Britain could develop further than it did. They thought the Chartists, which of course was the first revolutionary party, as Lenin called it, was a mass organisation of the working class. They hoped that it could lead a struggle to overthrow the bourgeoisie, and as part of that process, the people of Ireland would be given full rights as part of a socialist Britain and Ireland. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen, and the movement went into abeyance. 
and then they put more emphasis on the right of the people of Ireland to have self-determination and independence, which they said would be the pathway also for liberating the British working class at that stage. So they had a changed position over a period of time. As we said about Trotsky also, of course, on the question of the Jewish population as well. And I think today, you know, if there was a mass movement of Palestinians, as you said, if there was the, you know, possibility of a successful intifada, which managed to carve out some type of Palestinian state for themselves, we would obviously support every gain made by an intifada or a mass struggle of the Palestinian masses. But we'd have to be honest also and point out the limits of it and how temporary such gains were going to be. And unless it was a movement that was also linked up to a mass movement of the Jewish working class Mm. to overthrow the Israeli ruling elite and for the Jewish working class to start to reorganise society along socialist lines, unless that happens, the Palestinian people on their own, unfortunately, will not be able to deliver all-out independence and a separate viable state. And, of course, it would also need the backing of the masses of the Middle East. We saw the traces of that beginning to develop nearly 10 years ago with the so-called Arab Spring, or the mass movement that took place in North Africa, in countries like Egypt and in the Middle East. Unfortunately, as we know, that all went down to, or most cases, led to bloody counter-revolution mm. because it wasn't the mass organisations of the working class with clear ideas to really give a way forward and overthrow the ruling elites in a number of countries. But the developments in Lebanon today, with the mass movement of people there, right across ethnic and sectarian lines, which is very progressive, that's a harbinger of what's to come. And that does show that there can be movements on the economic issues, on the social issues, but they can take up these very complex issues also of the national question. So that's the way forward. We support every struggle of the Palestinian masses, and we support every gain they make, But we also have to say, of course, that on the basis of capitalism, those gains will be limited and can be taken back. To return to the controversies and political debates which were taking place on the national question while Trotsky was alive, Lenin and Trotsky clashed with Joseph Stalin over the treatment of national minorities in the young Soviet Union. What was the content of these debates? Yes, even in the early years of the Soviet Union, there were clashes between Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin, And Stalin at that time was representing, not in a crystallised fashion, but he was representing the growing state bureaucracy, which was developing, of course, because of the huge privations in society and also because the socialist revolution had not successfully spread to key industrialised countries like Germany or Britain or France at that time. So the revolution was becoming isolated and all those huge material pressures were there and it found some of its expression in a developing bureaucracy which was adopting many of the manners of the czarist bureaucracy. Mm. So it was high-handed towards the other nationalities. It was a great Russian chauvinism, as Lenin called it, that existed inside the bureaucracy in Russia at that time. And there was a number of collisions with Stalin. Lenin famously, of course, very sharply rebuked Stalin over his treatment of leading Bolsheviks in Georgia because he had such a high-handed approach towards them. It was one of his last struggles with Stalin. It was one of the things he said that made him convinced that Stalin should not be the general secretary or hold any key position inside the Bolshevik party. And this is despite Stalin being Georgian himself? Despite Stalin being Georgian himself. And Stalin, whenever, I think it was the 12th Congress of the Communist Party, at that meeting, Stalin drafted some resolutions and he put forward the idea that every minority nationality in Russia had to adhere to the Young Federation, Socialist Federation, but there was no mention of it being free or voluntary (laughs) or equal. It was like an implicit command that they had, and what he in essence meant was they had to adhere to the big nation, to Russia. And Lenin took Stalin up on this issue, and Lenin was pushed back on that issue and others concerning the national question. But in some issues, Lenin didn't get his way. I mean, Lenin also said there should be a rotation of the president of the Soviet Union between the different nationalities, mm. which would obviously be a sign of goodwill to all the different nationalities. But that never happened. Kalinin mm. was a Russian, and he was the only president during that period. Again, that was, if you like, the work of Stalin at that period. So, you know, Stalin always had this high-handed manner towards the other nationalities, and then it became a greater and greater clash between him and Lenin, and then between him and Trotsky at that stage. And then by the 1930s, any semblance of a genuine federation of nations in the Soviet Union was just gone. It was ruled by high command, 
from the Kremlin and the peoples of the different nationalities were treated appallingly, particularly in places like Ukraine, where it led to mass famine mm. and terrible national oppression. And of course, the Russian working class also suffered under Stalinism as well. But on the national question, the maltreatment of the national minorities was then a propaganda coup for the West and for capitalist supporters because they could say, look, this is your so-called socialist state. This is how these nationalities are treated. And later on, in the 1930s, the Nazis tried to find a way and to defeat the Soviet Union via Ukraine mm. because in Ukraine there were reactionary nationalists who linked up with the Nazis in the 1930s. And the only basis in which they were able to even do this was because of the appalling treatment of the Ukrainian peasants and working class, where, as I said, there had been mass enforced collectivization, which led to mass famine and just, you know, terrible treatment of their national rights. And whenever the Nazi Germany invaded Czechoslovakia in 1938, by doing so, they were able to take part of a territory which had Ukrainian speakers and right-wing nationalists amongst them. So they used that as a bridgehead to try and get support inside the Ukraine. And Trotsky at this stage, and this goes back to the flexibility of a Marxist position on the national question, Trotsky at that stage put forward the idea of an independent Soviet Ukraine. And that shocked a lot of people on the left, even some of his own supporters, because he was calling for this country to separate from the Soviet Union mm. at that stage. But Trotsky said that rather than weaken the ideas of revolutionary socialism, this would strengthen it, because a genuinely independent Soviet Ukraine would entail a political revolution. And a political revolution, as Trotsky explained, was a revolution of the workers of the Soviet Union, where they would overthrow Stalinism, they'd mm -hmm. overthrow that bureaucracy, which had become monstrous by the 1930s, and reintroduce the workers' democracy which had been there in the early years of the revolution under Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks, that would be reintroduced. It would massively rejuvenate the Soviet economy because mm -hmm. you'd bring in a genuinely democratically planned economy once more. Rather than this distant bureaucracy making decisions which didn't correspond to the needs on the ground. Exactly. And that would then allow the possibility of an independent Ukrainian state to come back into a genuine federation on a free and equal basis. So Trotsky put that forward because the situation was hurtling towards the Second World War mm. and Stalin's crimes had become so monstrous it was necessary to put forward that demand of self-determination at that stage for Ukraine. Now, you've mentioned the surprise which Trotsky gave to the left in 1939 calling for an independent Soviet Ukraine, but Ukraine still today has important national questions on the dispute between the two spheres of influence modern capitalist Russia and the capitalist mm. European Union, for example. Could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, and this again shows how the national question is always a work in progress, if you like. <laughs> and Marxists have to be very flexible, have to be principled on our attitudes and the rights of the nationalities, but also flexible in the sense that the situation can change and what position we put forward can sometimes change. So, for example, in Ukraine, you may remember a few years ago there was the bloody conflict between the Ukrainian state and the Russian state, mainly, not directly, but through other forces, and it mainly found expression in the so-called breakaway republics of eastern Ukraine, which included cities like Donetsk and other areas like that. And, you know, normally speaking, when we talk about a nationality, we mean a common language or a common culture or a common territory or some of those elements but the common territory is the most normal one mm. that people will put forward for a viable nation state. And in the situation of the breakaway of a number of these little cantons, in effect, from the central control of the Ukrainian state, we saw that you know they declared themselves republics. They were predominantly ethnic Russian peoples. And we would support their right not to be part of a state they do not want to be in. Sure. Because it means coercion for them to stay inside the Ukrainian state. But we would also say that there can be no illusions in Putin's Russia. Mm. Putin has no interest, genuine interest in the peoples of those breakaway areas of Ukraine. And that's been borne out because if you look at the years since the breakaway, there's still conflict. I mean, there's still a shooting war going on in those areas at, at different levels, but it still continues. There's endemic poverty. The infrastructure in many situations is, is very basic or broken down. And there's just mass unemployment. So it's a desperate situation for those people. So they've not found redemption as formally appealing to Russia, mm -hmm. to be part of Russia. Putin has been very limited in the resources he's put in to those enclaves for his own interests. And they've been used as pawns 
in the dispute with Ukraine and just the general dispute between Russia and Ukraine and of course what lies behind Ukrainian nationalists of course is the right wing or the imperialist powers in the West. Mm. So it's a very unfortunate situation facing the people of those breakaway republics but we would support the right to determine their future and we would argue of course that you know we shouldn't be coerced into capitalist Ukraine but you're not going to be any better off as part of capitalist oligarch dominated Putin's Russia mm. But therefore, they should be able to determine their future. And we would say it just reinforces the need for a socialist federation of nations and minorities in that part of the world. And also, you may remember back at that time, there was a huge contentious issue amongst the left internationally over the question of Crimea Mm. and what was taking place there. And we argued that, of course, whenever the Russian forces went into Crimea, they very often dressed up as soldiers belonging to nobody. But everybody Mm. knew it was Russian forces (laughs) in that country. And there was a referendum held to determine the future of Crimea and by a majority it was agreed to become again part of Russia to break away from the Ukraine. Now historically the Crimea has been shifted between different countries and there's been coming and goings of different peoples but certainly for the last number of decades the majority of people in it do come from an ethnic Russian background but that's not all there's also the Tartars who are the original peoples there and they were historically oppressed by Stalin. Yeah historically oppressed by Stalin and, you know, are obviously are comfortable in a Crimea that's broken off from Ukraine mm. at this stage. Now, at the time, we in the CWA said that even given the oppressive nature of the referendum, where people are voting at the end of a gun, basically, mm. it still seemed to us, and by all accounts and all reports, and by people on the ground we spoke to at the time, it did seem that the majority of people did want to leave Ukraine and probably wanted to link up with Russia, and that is their right if they want to do that. But we said to diffuse argument, if you like, What should take place is a genuine democratic referendum Mm -hmm. without any military forces involved at all. It should be overseen by workers in the local community themselves democratically. Or we said, given that time when there was mass upsurge, there was conflict, but there was big movements of peoples as well, we did put forward the idea of a revolutionary constituent assembly, like a revolutionary parliament, Mm -hmm. that could determine the future of Crimea as well, which would determine its future, but also guarantee the rights of all minorities, of the Tartars and others. And that was our position at that time. That, again, I think shows the flexibility Marxists have to have in these situations. As it is now, the Crimea, the breakaway areas of eastern Ukraine, it's in a dire situation economically. And it's not had the huge funds that were hinted at by the Putin regime at that time. But, of course, the Ukrainian regime, despite it's had a turnover of leaders, it's got a professional comedian now, of course, who is the president... (laughs) And so on. Yeah, but, that's right. He played the president in a TV show exactly. and, and became the president yeah. in real life. Yeah, and he largely bends to the will of the Western powers and yeah. funneled through the EU. So he's not some independent character based himself on the genuine needs of the people <laughs> of Ukraine. What's needed in Ukraine, and we've been talking to you know comrades in the Ukraine the last few weeks on this issue, what's needed is the development of strong independent workers' unions. There are attempts in that direction which cross all the ethnic and national divisions and, of course, you know, a party of the working class as well, which also w- would include those from an ethnic Russian background, those from an ethnic Ukrainian background and others. And if anything, if the last 10 years of the conflict in Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia has shown is that there's no way out on the basis of any of the so-called solutions of capitalism or of the offer of any of the right-wing nationalists in that part of the world. Now... Shortly before we began recording this series on Trotsky and Trotskyism, the big news around the world was the latest uprising, really, of Black Lives Matter protests, which indicates that black and white working class youth will tend to come together to resist injustice, exploitation, oppression. Now, given this, why did Trotsky in the 1930s raise the possibility of a separate black state coming into existence in the United States of America? Yeah, the question of a separate black state was a big issue of debate amongst the left in the US back in the 1930s. The American Communist Party had changed its position in the 1930s and put forward the idea of a separate state for the oppressed black population. Trotsky supporters, the Trotskyists, or the, you know, what had been the left opposition then became the Trotskyists. The Fourth and, International. And the Fourth International and the Socialist Workers' Parties that became in the United States at that stage. They reacted against that position by the Communist Party and the Stalinists, and they put the emphasis on the need for unity of black and white workers, for all the rights of the oppressed black population to be struggled for, so economic, social and so on, as part of a struggle for a socialist society. And broadly speaking, Trotsky was sympathetic with that, of course, 
but he did say that in the conditions of the 1930s in America that it would be wrong to discount the theoretical possibility of a mass movement developing amongst the black population for their own separate state. Mm. And if that mass movement did develop and there was a territorial basis to it, that Trotskyists or the Marxists should not stand against it. So he was trying to correct a bit of a one-sided position that the Trotskyists in America had at that stage, which, of course, their position was based on a reaction to Stalinism. Mm. And the American Communist Party, of course, they never asked, if you like, the black population what they wanted. (laughs) They told them this is the best for you to have a separate state. And that was dangerous in the workers' movement because that could give the impression that the white working class wanted separation Mm. and were advocating separation before that became a mass demand amongst the black population. But it is true that in the 1930s, There could have been the territorial basis for it. The majority of the black population still lived in the southern states. Mm -hmm. There was at least two states which had a black majority. And it was only after the Second World War that that demographic situation began to radically change, where there was mass migration by the black population to the northern states. And they became much smaller in the south, but still a significant part of the population. But also, of course, after the Second World War, you had the growth of unions, and uh, you had more of the black population becoming more proletarianized. They were no longer working on the land in the south as much. They were now part of industry in the north, and they were more part and parcel of the industrial working class Mm. in the north. And in that sense, the idea of a black separate homeland receded very strongly. It came up again a bit during the development of struggles by the black population in the 1960s and the the 1970s, civil rights movement and so on. But it was always a minor, it was always a minority position. The Black Panther Party, as it developed, opposed it because they saw it as unnecessarily creating division Mm -hmm. at that point in time rather than the black and white population coming together for a struggle, which you know their best leaders said should be a socialist struggle at that stage. And today, of course, with the Black Lives Movement protests, which are significant and a great step forward, as we saw, and took on an international form as well, we saw that in the United States that many white youth or youth from a Latino background and so on come out and supported those protests. They were in support of the struggle against racism, against racist police methods, but also, of course, they were all against the poverty many of them were facing, the mass unemployment many youth are now facing, and just a real anger at the Trump administration and capitalism itself. So that would indicate, of course, that any ideas of separation and separate homeland is definitely something that's not on the agenda for the vast majority of the population, and I think that is the case. But, of course, it doesn't mean it can't come back onto the agenda again, particularly if the workers' movement in America and internationally does not give a clear alternative and give a lead to these mass movements, which was woefully hardly there at all in the Black Lives Movement, Mm. where there wasn't enough involvement by trade unions and so on, not in the sense of taking them over, but giving aid and support and bringing the resources and the experience of the workers' movement to those protests in a very collaborative manner. That didn't happen in many cases. And if that process was to develop, the ideas of black separation, of black nationalism, can understandably begin to grow again, Mm. because a bigger and bigger part of the oppressed black population particularly the unemployed and so on in the most poor areas, can begin to think that that's the only way out. There is no other way out on, on the, you know, this system. And as Marxists, we'd have to very sensitively take up those ideas with a lot of tact. But I think we'd have to say that those are a cul-de-sac. They're not a way forward. They're not going to lead to the liberation of the black population or the population as a whole. And the way to do that, of course, is to struggle for a socialist society where the rights of all minorities are guaranteed. Because there's not the same basis that there was in the 1930s for a black nation-state in that sense. Is that the reason? There's not the same territorial basis as there was in the past. I mean, under socialism, I mean, Lenin and Trotsky did theorise, if you like, that under socialism you could have big movements of people across the world under a socialist world where there's not the sort of visa requirements and all the oppression that you get at national borders today. And if significant parts of different nationalities or even especially oppressed ethnic groups wanted to establish their own common territory and see how they live together and experiment to some degree, that should be open under a socialist world. So these things are all possible. Mm. But under capitalism, of course, we're dealing with a different situation. We're dealing with class exploitation and class oppression and also just the reality of what's on the ground. And at the moment, of course, in the United States, there's been such a big demographic change since the 1930s when Trotsky did raise the theoretical possibility of a separate black state. Today, where would that state be? Mm. You know, how could that be carved out without causing, you know, enormous collisions with other populations and so on? So it's a different question than it was in the 1930s. But still, of course, 
whilst the civil rights movement in America in the 1960s and 70s won very important gains because of mass struggle and sacrifice we see by the Black Lives Movement protests, there's still a long way to go and there's still a lot of institutionalised racism in American society and the only way to end that institutionalised racism is to change the institutions mm. and changing the institutions means a socialist reorganisation of society ultimately because even if big gains are made for the black working class and black people in general, the ruling class will always rely on racism and other differences to create divisions in society and to create divisions amongst the working class. We see it all the time on the basis of gender and sex, orientation, nationality. This can be done again and again by the ruling class in order to cut across, in particular, mass movements that threaten their rule. So, in the time that Trotsky was helping to develop these ideas alongside Lenin and other leading Marxists. And today as well, these are periods of extraordinary convulsion for human civilization, particularly for capitalist society, as it enters a prolonged period of crisis, presenting opportunities to move past it to the next stage of human civilization, which we would see as socialism around the world. And the struggle for national liberation, which is a task left over, from the fight against feudalism in many cases, something which has to be completed on the path to spreading socialism around the world, organising across national, ethnic, cultural lines, all the various different divisions which the capitalists and other ruling classes use to try and divide ordinary people, in particular the working class, against each other. This is absolutely essential, but while this can seem paradoxical on the surface, achieving that unity means allowing the fullest possible autonomy, including complete separation, for different nationalities. That actually that is the route to achieving international cooperation and ultimately a world without borders and in fact without states. But immediately in this period, when we're working towards a kind of development which can set us on that trajectory, national questions are once again coming to the fore. So we've mentioned Northern Ireland, Scotland, Catalonia, these are all current examples. There's examples which could arise again, like Quebec and Canada. There's West Papua in the Pacific Mm. region at the moment as well. The largest nation without a state today is the Kurds. And if you want to hear more on that specific struggle, you can refer to episode 44, Kurdish National Liberation. But You've mentioned, Niall, that in fact the national question has become even more complex today than it was in the time that Lenin and Trotsky were coming up with the ideas which we now rely on and develop. So do Lenin and Trotsky's ideas on national liberation still apply? I think so very much because I think what they show in general is that a Marxist understanding of the national question is not some sort of blueprint that's mechanically applied in all situations across time and space. I mean, if you look at Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky and their approach, it was principled but flexible, and they showed that the national question is not set in stone, it's a living, changing phenomena that demands from us careful study and a correct application of demands and programme. And that will become even more so, as you said, because of the choppy waters we're now entering with economic crisis of capitalism internationally. So that will exacerbate the national questions that are already there. And, you know, we always have to be flexible and look at things very concretely. Whilst we do support, in general, the right of self-determination for nations, it doesn't mean we advocate separation in every circumstance. Mm. It is very concrete. So, for example, in the 1930s, Trotsky did not support the referendum of the Tsarland. It was an area that, after the First World War, was a League of Nations mandate, had a majority German ethnic population and Hitler and the Nazis campaigned for it to be brought back in to Germany. From where? It was overlooked as a mandate by the League of Nations with some involvement by France at that stage. Okay. It was a small area. It was a big issue in the workers' movement and internationally, generally, in the 1930s. On the face of it, those people should have had the right to decide if they want to go back into Germany or not. Sure. But of course, Lenin said, well, that would mean if they said yes to that, they're going under the heel of Nazism. Mm. And no trade unionist or worker or socialist could support that. Mm. So therefore, in that instance, he did not support the formal self-determination because the wider superseding interests of the working class had to be taken into account. And that's always the benchmark for Marxists on this issue. As you said, the national question and the resolution of it is a legacy of the unfinished bourgeois revolution, of the unfinished capitalist democratic revolution of earlier centuries. And it's the workers' movement that will overcome that process and overcome those issues over a period of time through socialist revolution fundamentally and ultimately. 
But of course, we always have to be alert to who's demanding independence at any given time. What are their motivations and are they in the interest of the working class? And any demand for self-determination and independence that goes against the interests of the general working class and is a retrograde backward step for the working class, we couldn't support. But any movement that would be a step forward for the working class as a whole and it would bring about genuine improvement in democratic rights, then the Marxists should support it. That's the general benchmark, but in each case has to be looked at specifically. So we can't tell ahead what position we might have on some national issue that might erupt. We have to specifically look at it and look at it in its all-sided way in the future. So, for example, Marx and Engels, whilst they championed the independence of Ireland and the independence of Poland, at one stage they were against the formal, if you like, independence of some of the Slav nations because those who were championing that were the Tsarist regime Mm. and they were exploiting those peoples on a national basis, but they were doing that not for the interests of those people, but to further the interests of the reactionary Tsarist regime, which is the bulwark of reaction in Europe at that point in time. So Marx and Engels didn't support those demands at that stage. Of course, later on, Trotsky, when he lived in the Balkans for a period of time, he was a correspondent at that time for a liberal newspaper, a war correspondent during the 1912-1913 Balkan Wars. He put forward the idea of a federation of the peoples of the Balkans because the conflicts were so complex and interwoven that whilst he supported self-determination for nations of the Balkans in and of itself, just the separation and the setting up of new states would just lead to new oppressions Mm -hmm. and therefore he called for a federation. We'd update that. We do update that with the call for a socialist federation of the Balkans, Mm -hmm. which we put forward, including in the 1990s when the former Yugoslavia fell apart. Mm -hmm. And we did say there's a genuine right here of self-determination, but we couldn't support the machinations of the imperialist powers who were coming in to carve up Yugoslavia. We put forward the idea of a genuine federation on a socialist basis in that part of the world. So I think all those examples just show that there's no panacea we just apply to the national question forever and a day. It has to be looked at concretely and in a Marxist principled way, but putting forward the clear demands. And that would include somewhere like, as you said, the Kurdish issue, which is very complex because the Kurdish people, of course, are the biggest nation in the world without their own state. Mm. And they're scattered among several different countries. There's a different level of consciousness amongst Kurds in different parts of those areas. Some may want more enhanced autonomy Mm -hmm. or separation for themselves. Others may want to link up to the other Kurdish areas and create one large Kurdish state. What we say is they should be given the right, at least, (laughs) to Mm. decide where they want to go, which is denied by all those countries. Although sometimes they can play the Kurdish card, different ruling elites which oppress them can call for the liberation of the Kurds in other countries because it serves their interests. So we say those people should have the right to determine their own future. And what that may be, if it's a federation of the Kurdish people, if it's a single state, that's up to them. But that right, of course, is denied on the basis of capitalism because it goes against the territorial interests of several ruling classes in different countries. And the only way to overcome that is to struggle, obviously, for it, but is on the basis of a socialist federation of that region. And that question of the Socialist Federation and of the social force in society which is struggling for national liberation, that force being the working class, that is the central issue for Marxists to come out of this. It's a central issue because the working class is the only force, the only social force in society that can said to have a genuine interest in the liberation of oppressed nationalities. We have different nationalist movements, including of the oppressed, which have right-wing features And they want independence, they want separation because it serves their interests. They then become the ruling elite of these new regimes. Mm. And of course, as we see in history, very often that has happened. And one of the first things they do is start oppressing the minorities in their own countries. Mm. So they can't be trusted. And of course, as we've seen also, they do not raise the living standards dramatically of the peoples of those countries post-separation or post-independence because they're still basing themselves on capitalism. Mm. They're still basing themselves on the boss's system. So we cannot trust those forces, their motivations and their interests. And also, because they're quite timid and weak, in most countries they're not even prepared to have a proper struggle for Mm. self-determination, as we'd see even today in a very modern sense with the SNP and the nationalist parties in Catalonia. Mm. They don't actually struggle for full independence. As, they're they're as pushed in that direction by the workers underneath them in some cases. Pushed further than they want to go very often, that's right. 
and then they will limit what they were prepared to do. The SNP, during the referendum for independence a few years ago... In Scotland. In Scotland. We're still prepared to accept that the Queen would be the head of the state, <laughs> that you know, foreign policy would have to be part of an overall British in relation to England and the English state and so on. So they're prepared to make big compromises. The Quebec bourgeoisie are very much the same, the nationalists in Quebec. They're not prepared to have a third go and struggle for real meaningful change. The working class, when it wants to have liberation national liberation. As Trotsky said, very often that nationalism is the outer shell of an inner Bolshevism. So it's a demand for democratic rights, it's a demand for the end of oppression, but it also is linked to a yearning for social liberation and economic liberation or from a different type of society. So the nationalism very often in a number of countries of the working class is completely different to the nationalism of the petty bourgeois and the bourgeois. And that's why these movements, we would argue, need to be led by the working class with their class interests to the fore. And in that way, they can bring with them also the other minorities who will not feel threatened under a new independent state. And by doing so, they can lead not just to national liberation, but to socialist liberation as well. And after all, that is what happened with the Bolshevik Revolution. That revolution would never have taken place without that sort of programme being inscribed on the banner of the Bolsheviks, which was Lenin's position. And of course, Trotsky wholeheartedly agreed with that position. And that led to their great success in 1917. And of course, the world's moved on. Things are very different in many ways. But in broad brushstrokes, that is still our aim and our model, if you like, for a new society. Now, as always, if you like what you've heard, recommend us to your co-workers and friends, donate to help fund us. And if you agree, join the socialists. You can read more about today's topic and all the other topics we're running in this series in the new book of Leon Trotsky. The Committee for Workers International is also holding an international online rally for the 80th anniversary of Leon Trotsky's assassination. The ideas that couldn't be killed, and you can sign up to attend that at socialistworld.net. That's happening on Sunday the 23rd of August at 2pm London time. Niall, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, James. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for Workers International. Today we heard from Niall Mulholland, speaking to James Ivans, and I'm Scott Jones. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. The CWI is holding an international online rally for the 80th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination, entitled Why Couldn't His Ideas Be Killed? It's on Sunday the 23rd of August from 2pm London time. You can register to attend at socialistworld.net. You can find further reading on this episode in the notes in your podcast app, and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? We need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. And if you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Until next time, solidarity.